This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. This is the Human Action Podcast, and we're joined today by our friend, Dr. Sean Rittenauer, a professor of economics at Grove City College in Pennsylvania. It's been almost 100 years since Mises literally wrote the book on socialism, where he explains why central planning can't work, why socialism isn't moral or ethical or inevitable, but in fact destructive of civilization and everything good that civilization produces. This book from 1922 is titled Socialism, an Economic and Sociological Analysis. It's the book you need to read or be reading if you want to counter your socialist friends or the nonsense you hear coming out of Washington, D.C. You can find it at Mises.org by searching for socialism and read it for free in PDF format or go to Mises.org slash socialism, the book. That's Mises.org slash socialism, the book, and enter the special code H-A-P-O-D for Human Action Podcast to get a discount on it. So stay tuned for a discussion of socialism. Well, good morning, Dr. Sean Rittenauer, and thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it, you know, you and I, when we were kids growing up under Reagan, could, you know, could we ever have imagined that Americans would be talking about socialism uh, this openly, or at least that s- certain Democrats in Congress would be talking about socialism this openly just a couple decades later? It seemed like such a golden time relative to now almost. Oh, I know. It's, it's as if... Um... Well, we've completely forgot history and, and, and we've taken leave of our senses. It's, it's amazing to me. Yeah. And the other thing that's amazing is that Mises wrote this book 100 years ago, and so much of it reads perfectly fine today, perfectly descriptive today. I mean, that is, I think, a tribute to him when you write something lasting that applies 100 years later. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's you know timely as today's headlines. Uh, there's so much in that in this book that is relevant for uh, you know political discussions that are going on right now. Well, I want to give our listeners a little bit of the backdrop in which Mises writes this book. He finishes it in 22. So this is the famous interwar period and a prolific period for Mises. He produces uh, Nation, State, and Economy in 1919, yep. uh, Socialism in 22, Liberalism in 1927, and of course, National Economy a few years later in 1940. This is a prolific interwar period for him. And we have to recall that he is coming out of having been a first lieutenant in the Austro-Hungarian army in World War I, Uh, He was an artillery officer, uh, and he wasn't particularly young, as a matter of fact, when he went off uh, as a first lieutenant in 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 1914. He was already uh, over 30 years of age. He had already produced uh, a a major work in the theory of money and credit. This isn't a 17-year-old kid going off to war. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I I think that just his age... uh, made the the effects of the war a little bit even more prescient to him. Well, and and I know he talks about during his darkest moments in the war and typical uh, people of his generation, he doesn't talk about it a lot. Right. But but he talks about dark moments in the war and he tells himself, he promises himself that he is going to write a book on, among other things, socialism and and what it really means. So I think that's it's so interesting that he that he was able to follow through with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it was pretty clear that at the time when he he wrote the book, he thought he was sort of standing against uh, the tide, both with regard to uh, the academics, the academia, and and the masses in general. Um, I mean, the the aftermath of World War One saw significant uprisings in uh, socialist ideology, socialist even revolution. Uh, in Europe, and so uh, th- this wasn't this this wasn't merely an academic exercise for Mises. And of course, he's writing this book where, in an era where Marx and Engels are really coming into sway in Europe. I mean, th- these are not remote ideas at the time. Oh yeah, and and you know, people who we now you know we'd be shocked to think that they were sympathetic to socialism, but people like Lionel Robbins and Hayek even were attracted to uh, to socialist ideology. And um, so this, you know, Mises's book uh, did a tremendous service, uh, you know, to the Western world. One thing I note about it, if you just look at the table of contents, the sweep of the book, this is not an economics book per se, 
Of course, it's famous for his, his refutation of, the, of, of socialism in terms of the calculation issue. Uh, but it, this is a book that is about history. It's about politics. It's about sociology. And I'm struck by this, the, the temerity of someone who would write such a book be, because he really came up as an economist at a time where that wasn't so much seen as a standalone discipline to which one remained cloistered. I mean, he's, he's writing a, a sweeping book, and that was just a lot more common back then. Economics hadn't become this specialized discipline yet. Right. I mean, it, it, it had become, you know, uh, the, the main issues that economists would look at had become a little more uh, focused, but it was it was standard practice for uh, even economic thinkers to put economics in the broader sociological context. I mean, I, th- I do think it's it's interesting that the uh, the subtitle of the English uh, edition was an economic and sociological analysis, and that's definitely what he was trying to do. Uh, he was trying to bring, as he said, uh, history to bear, political philosophy to bear, um, sociology to bear, as well as economics on the issue of uh, the nature and consequences of socialism. Don't you think if an economist wrote a book like this today, that he or she would be attacked and told to stay in their lane and and stick to economics? Well, especially by people that uh, disagreed with them, for sure. Um, <laughs> you'd say, look, you're not an expert on these other issues, so just you know, go play with your marbles. But why is that? How did that happen? Why? It, it seems to me as a lay person that economists today don't talk enough to other fields and disciplines and that they're a little bit stuck in their own space and that they ought to be talking more about sociology or history or, or uh, politics. Yeah. Well, I think a, a couple of reasons. I think I – think, I do think on the one hand the sort of the nature of specialization – can lend one to being overly narrow, uh, and that's what's happened in all academic branches. Um, on the other hand, I think too, I think that the nature of the development of economics as a profession, becoming more focused on abstract modeling, um, has made a- a- economists more inclined to sort of stay in their their intellectual ivory tower, so to speak. Uh, because these other areas, it's hard. It's hard to model a lot of these other, uh, you know, these these other issues that come from history or political philosophy or what have you, sociology. It's hard to fit it in a nice maximization model. In some ways, I think that that has a role to play. And then, and then, uh, quite frankly, I think that a lot of professional economists are just are, are really consumed with the economic modeling day in day out. They don't. They interpret everything, their entire experience within the realm of economics. And I remember one of the maxims that I was taught by one of my professors at Auburn was, you know, if you're going to be a good economist, you have to have a life outside of economics. And I think that it's it's imperative if you're going to if you're going to be wise about economic theory and economic policy, you have to have it has to touch the real world. And of course, I think Austrians are very suited to do that because they build their economic analysis on realistic human action. Well, of course, Mises was uniquely suited to do that. I think he's coming out of the of monarchy, the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. He's seeing World War I. He's seeing the birth almost of a new Europe and the new patchwork quilt of small countries. Austria shrinks to a, a tiny country relative to its its past. I, I mean, he's, he's, he's anything but an ivory tower economist. He's working for the Viennese, gov- or the Viennese government. He's involved in fiscal policy. He's involved in all kinds of things. That's right, right. Um, he was... He was also, uh, at the time of writing this book, hosting his uh, private seminar already. So he was becoming, uh, I mean, like personally engaged with the the, the great intellects uh, of his day as well. Well, so as he dives into this book, let's just talk a little bit about the the milieu, in other words, the environment, Uh, Marxism, socialism really on the rise uh, and there was this sort of – at that point, an existing argument that, look, uh, people wouldn't dislike work so much. They wouldn't be so alienated from it if they shared more of their products of their own labor. And and so Mises re- replies to this by saying socialism is almost a non-economic system. And, and this is really the genesis of part one, which is called liberalism and socialism. He really gets into a, a lot of history and getting at the root of what 
socialism really is as a counterforce to liberalism. Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, he's very clear by distinguishing between uh, liberalism or the free society with socialism, and he begins at at the. I mean, it, it, you know, looking back, it's like exactly the right place to start, which is you distinguish the two based on the nature of ownership, and the ownership of of, of goods and. What type of ownership does the does a system possess? And socialism, he defines it as a system where the state owns all the material factors of production. Uh, the free society or liberalism would be where uh, we have private ownership of the means of production. And then the 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 consequences of in many ways the consequences of the rest of the book flows from that uh, that distinction. And he's foreshadowing or, or making a nascent argument that he developed more in liberalism about five years later. I mean, we can clearly see the framework for that. He's, he's stressing property, for example. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting that he builds specifically on Menger's exposition of the interrelationship of goods that um, uh, you and uh, Joe Salerno talked about a couple of a uh, few weeks ago. Uh, looking at Menger's principles, where he talks about the, you know, he, he sees that the economy, if you will, is not a monolithic thing. It's a network of uh, exchange relationships, shall we say, between the producers of uh, consumer goods and then producers of various stage higher order goods. And it's it's this understanding that also um, uh, fuels his, his understanding of the weakness of, of, uh, socialism as a, as an economic system. Well, I want to get back to your definition real quick. The Mises provides a definition for socialism. That's a little different than a Rothbardian or Hoppian definition. In other words, they, they took it a little farther than I think Mises would have. Um, you know, I think that's probably true. I think Mises was, it's interesting, you know, Mises, did uh, write this book that is very broad in terms of its connection with these other disciplines, but at the same time, he's very careful to uh, wanted to define um, the socialism in economic terms and, and focuses very narrowly on issues of ownership and property. Right. But he points out, he, he takes pains actually to point out that you know the idea of having a social safety net or something is not socialism per se in the Misesian sense. That's that's right. Yes, exactly right. The things that, for instance, if you look at, say, uh, Hoppe's uh, social, uh, theory of socialism and capitalism, he develops these types of socialism and uh, certain types of socialism, I think Mises may have just identified as interventionism, that Mises was very much a, a state a de facto state ownership, and by that he meant ultimate control of factors of production, whereas Later writers like Rothbard and uh, and, and Hoppe would have expand maybe expanded the definition a little bit and uh, talk about you know tendencies towards socialism or socialistic type of arrangements that perhaps weren't as full blown as what Mises was talking about. But let's get to his his idea of private ownership versus. Uh, collective or state or communal ownership or something. I, I, America in 2019, in Sean Rittenauer's view. Uh, we have all kinds of partial diminutions of property rights, whether that's regulations or taxes or whatever it might be. Do, it, it, do you see this as as a, making America a semi-socialist country, or would you side more with Mises that no, we, we're talking about at least in in, a, in an abstract or theoretical concept, uh, a country where where the state truly owns outright the factors of production? Yeah, that's a good. I would say I would say it kind of depends on the day that you ask me. <laughs> Um, some days we, uh, it just feels more socialistic than others. Um, I think that there's value in Mises's definition, um, because it, what, what can happen is, I mean, if we define socialism as any, uh, sort of broad sweeping, uh, interventionist policy, we can, we can lose some of the force of our, of our critique by sort of finding a socialist under every bush. And so I think we need to be careful about that. Um, on the other hand, I, I do think that, you know, any type of intervention, when the state intervenes, you're, you're, the state is controlling how people can use their property. And so in, in that sense, 
every intervention is tending towards socialism, I would say, even if the, the, the rulers that are trying to do this will say, absolutely not. We don't want to, we don't want to own, you know, all the means of production. But when you start controlling how people can use uh, their means of production and, and what means that you can use and what's off limits and what's not, uh, that just definitely, you know, pushes us towards socialism. So I, um, you know, I think it, it kind of just depends for my money. It depends on the context. I mean, I don't see how anybody could look at, say, the government school system and and not today and not see it uh, pretty socialist. And so there are different there are different areas of our you know of our lives that I think are are definitely more socialist than others. Right. And of course, there's also a semantic or a conceptual difference. I mean, libertarians have always called public schools socialist. That's right. And and, and I'm sure Ronald Reagan in 1980 would have scoffed at that. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but so. You know what? What this book is perhaps most famous for in in Austria libertarian circles is that Mises demolishes the idea that planned economies can somehow coherently allocate resources. So he's not making a moral or really even an ideological critique of socialism so much as he's saying it can't work. And here yes. we have the famous socialist calculation issue. So give give us the broad strokes of of the the argument that Mises makes in this book. Yeah, well, um, I, I think you're right. This is a very important argument, in some sense, the core argument for the entire entire book. And he he essentially uh, reproduces um, a large part of his 1920 article on uh, economic calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, and um, it, it's core because so many of his other arguments related to uh, socialism's uh, desirability or lack thereof hinge on this this just fact that it's impractical. And so he roots this argument in his analysis of human action. Uh, and here again, I think you find the, um, what should one say, the the beginnings of uh, uh, Mises's, shall we say, praxeology at work, his praxeological framework, beginning the analysis um, with rational human action, purposeful behavior. And he notes that all action involves a choice of achieving some end but when we do that, when we choose to do anything, we necessarily are leaving some other end unfulfilled because we can't do everything. And uh, one thing that comes through this book again and again is just the fact of scarcity. We can't, you know, to, to quote uh, the Rolling Stones, we can't always get what we want. And so we have to we have to make choices. And such a choice to achieve some ends and leave others unfulfilled requires v- evaluation. Uh, we have to we value things. We have to we decide we're going to do what we most prefer and not do what we prefer less. Then he makes a jump then and says, OK, this is what humans do all the time when we're trying to decide how to um, produce uh, goods or provide goods and, 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 and commodities and services in a complex market division of labor, which is the type of society that is a growing, flourishing society. It becomes com- it becomes complicated making the decisions. What should we do and what should we not do? And this type of productive activity in a complex market division of labor requires careful uh, consideration about you know what's the best what should we produce? What's the best way we should produce it in order that we're not wasting scarce resources? He uses the example of um, if we want to produce more electricity, should we? Uh, use a waterfall, or we, should we extend coal mining? How are we going to make that decision? And uh, he point, stresses that we need to make the we need to make objective decisions about production, and the only way we can do that rationally is we have to have some type of uh, unit, uh, some magnitude that we can use to compare, like we use uh, feet and inches to compare as people height, and we can say, well, this person's taller. Because they're, you know, this person's six foot tall, this person, other person's five foot tall. Well, that we can make a, an objective comparison because we know we have units, we have feet and inches, and those are objective. Um, well, what do we have? What does the economic decision maker have? Well, he notes we have we have money prices. Market prices become our unit of comparison. We can we can compare the expected selling price of a house with the sum of all the prices of the factors it takes to produce that house. And we can then on the basis of that comparison side, yes, we want to produce this house or we don't. Or we can say, yes, we want to produce the house, but we want to use 
We want to use uh, wooden two by fours instead of metal studs to produce the house. So we can make these kind of comparisons if we have uh, market prices. And so uh, market prices are what people use, what entre- economic decision makers use to um, to to calculate expected profit and loss. And if we don't have that, then we're then it's just then it's just pure guesswork. If we don't have that, then we're then we're stuck. And and so. That is precisely what socialism doesn't have, because um, in socialism, where all means of production are owned by the state, uh, they must be controlled by one will, either the economic czar or the central planning board. But with no private ownership, there's no real exchange of uh, land or labor or capital goods. And so there are no true prices for any of these factors. And so there's no actual economic calculation that can take place. Now, you know, uh, the central planner could sort of arbitrarily assign numbers to these things and call them prices, but those prices don't represent, they're not the products of uh, the subjective values of people actually in society. They're just arbitrary numbers. And so uh, the socialist central planner has no way to rationally decide how to produce a good and, and, and what goods to produce. So the central planner can't do calculations in kind. They just own all this stuff centrally. That's that's and, exactly correct. But I, I want to recognize that there's we're talking about two different things here, prices and values. Yeah. So Mises says exchange is the foundation of the economy. And and when we compare things, would I'd rather have this or that? Yes. These, these comparisons necessarily involve acts of valuation. But but we can't measure acts of valuation. We can just sort of have prices, and so it's not it's not just the ownership; it's the actual money prices that that give us the ability to calculate. It's it's not Absolutely. just it's it's not just our values. It's it's having a, a price attached to things. That's that's exactly right. That's why he notes that if we're going to have if we're going to have a uh, a system where we can. Uh, engage in economic calculation. Uh, we do have to have the pri- private ownership of the means of production, but we also have to have a general medium of exchange. In other words, these goods, these uh, land and labor, different capital goods and consumer goods all need to be traded against a common medium of exchange, money, so that the prices of all these goods, the exchange ratios for all these goods are enumerated in the same unit. And that's what allows for the actual uh, rational calculation. So what's what's the socialist response to this? I saw a Twitter exchange a couple of days ago where someone was saying, look at Walmart. They're so big. They're, they have the equivalent of the GDP of a, of a country. And within Walmart, uh, they, in, they apply centralized planning. And so uh, if, if Walmart could do it, why couldn't a country do it? So this was sort of the, the line of attack of someone from the left saying, well, w- wait a minute. Uh, you know, centralized planning happens all the time. It happens in gigantic firms, for example. Yeah, I think that, that that's an argument where um, they're sort of mistaking the rational planning on the part of an organization with uh, the planning that would be, you know, that would be necessary for – you know, an actual nation. I mean, to say that, well, you know, Walmart, quote unquote, Walmart nation is so big. Well, yeah, it's big. In some sense, that's precisely Mises's point. The only way that they could exist is that they, that they have, uh, they're able to use market prices for all of the, all the factors that they, that they employ, all the labor, all the land, all of the, uh, you know, all of the whole, the, the goods that they buy at wholesale, they know what the prices of these things are, and, and they have expected prices based on their forecast of demand uh, in their various stores. So they know or they, they think they have a good idea of how they can price these goods. And if they price them incorrectly, they know fairly quickly that this is not working, so they're going to make adjustments. I mean that – to me, I mean that – it completely misses the point. Walmart doesn't have to decide what's the best – Walmart doesn't have to decide what's the best way to make a dress shirt that they're going to use. They just have to know that this is the kind of dress shirt that we want, and this is the price we have to pay the manufacturer for the dress shirt, and this is the price that we can charge our customer. They don't have to. They don't have to plan, uh, you know, how the shirt's made, and that's just one good. I mean, imagine all. Think about all the consumer goods that they sell. They don't have to plan how any of that's made, because they're, they're not. They're only dealing with 
you know, one, basically one, one or two types of transactions and all of the other planning for all the, you know, for all the previous stages it takes to get to that point has already been done in, in a, in a decentralized market. So I just, to me, I mean, just on the face of it, that, that argument seems, um, uh, that just misses, it misses the point. Well, I'd like to add here, anybody who's familiar with the concept of transfer pricing in tax law, you know, big companies generally subdivide themselves into separate legal entities. They have subsidiary corporations. And for, for all we know, Walmart, each store might be a separate corporation. We don't know. But I will say this, having worked in transfer pricing in tax and big four accounting firms, companies care very much about assigning dollar costs to everything they've got in their inventory, everything they use in parts, uh, everything they, they tr that, that moves intercompany. Now, the, the tax man gets involved when they say, you know, gee, you ought to apply a markup to this and have some income uh, between your various companies that's taxable. But, but apart from that, I would say that, co that big companies absolutely assign or apply money prices in their own internal dealings with each other. Oh, oh for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, they can do that if there is, um, a, shall we say, an outside market where these goods are traded. And that's another point, by the way, that Mises makes in socialism, that, that, you know, there can be, as he calls it, sort of oases of socialism in a uh, broader uh, global market division of labor. And, and these, and these socialist, uh, you know, individual socialist countries, isolated socialist countries can exist uh, and, and sort of get along for some period of time as long as they can look outside their country and see what are the global market prices for various goods, and they can sort of use those uh, as benchmarks to calculate uh, for and, and to try to make economic decisions uh, based on those types of on those types of uh, on those types of prices. Sure, and we know actually as a fact that the former Soviet Union, when they were making trabants or zills, uh, they they took a look at Ford's. Uh, and Chevys and, and figured out how much Ford and Chevy were, were spending on everything and charging for everything when they decided how to, you know, build their own factories. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, it's interesting, though, <clears throat> that Mises brings up John Stuart Mill in all of this conversation. And Mill had this kind of strange distinction. He said, well, you know, ownership and appropriation of things, who, who owns things and who gets things, uh, the distribution of them, that's, that's not really part of economics. Economics is just production. But all these questions about, about distributing and appropriating stuff, which, of course, socialism attempts to do, that's, that's really not for economists. And they, they shouldn't talk about that sort of thing. And these are, these are questions we can deal with politically or, or even uh, morally or even from a utilitarian perspective. I thought that was interesting that, uh, because, because Mill continues to be seen, not by Mises, but he continues to, to be seen by a lot of people as, as sort of an early uh, exemplar of free markets. And and someone who believed in liberty uh, to an extent. Yeah, I mean, I think Mill's a classic case of someone. Depending on where you look in his work, he seems like a almost like a classical liberal. And then you look at other parts, and you think, oh well, no, he's not. Uh, and uh, Mises makes that point at the end of, uh, I believe, uh, liberalism makes that point. Uh, but yeah, I mean. Mises is again Mises rooting his analysis in reality, and then building on Menger's interrelationship between the higher and lower lower goods, uh, draws out the fact that look, it's it's not like we produce wealth and then the wealth is redistributed. The 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 production and exchange process that goes on on, on the market, production and income uh, formation uh, happens uh, together. He distinguishes between the, the free market uh, formation of income to the uh, socialist alleged distribution of income. And he notes that in a, in a, in a free market, the income is not uh, distributed. Uh, income is, is formed as people provide um, productive services or uh, provide goods that can be used uh, for production. And uh, or, of course, providing consumer goods to consumers that that income is formed by giving people what they want. Well, socialism has this completely 
as it severs the 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 uh, the organic link, shall we say, between production and income distribution, and and Mises would have none of it. Well, there's there's so many things that relate to this central argument in the book, the socialist calculation debate. And oftentimes they relate because, again, of when Mises was writing. This wasn't just an economics book and he's writing against a backdrop of rising collectivism. But I, that said, Sean, some of them seem a little strange a hundred years later. For example, towards the beginning of the book, he goes into this discursion of sorts about the social order and the family. Yes. And he gets into uh, you know relationships between men and women and children and sex and free love and prostitution. And it, that, that chapter reads a bit odd today. I wonder if, if, uh, if, if we could resurrect him, if he would say, well, I wish I hadn't written that. Or I, I wonder if he would say, oh, I 100 percent agree with that. You know, give us your take on, on when Mises gets a little far afield from what we're used to. Yeah, I think um, it, it is interesting. It's, it makes for fascinating reading, I, I will say. Um, I do think that, again, he's writing in a context where socialists, for instance, were making certain arguments uh, in favor of, of, of uh, so-called free love. And that that is sort of the, uh, you know, the, the be all and end all of, of freedom. And uh, you know, we're making the case that, you know, uh, a, a socialist order is necessary for us to be truly free from a whole host of things, including, you know, uh, sort of traditional uh, sexual mores. And uh, Mises was trying to make the case that, well, uh, actually, again, he's almost saying, that, look, you guys are engaging in, in romantic fantasy because in reality, there's always going to be, uh, I don't know, what should one say, uh, certain perspectives on uh, the relationship between uh, men and women, which will cause, uh, you know, sort of drive, you know, women to always want to pursue marriage. And uh, men, it made it very interesting where he was talking about how, in his mind, and it, this is contrary to what we normally think of, in his mind, women and sometimes are consumed with uh, consumed with sex uh, because, in some sense, they can't get they, they can't get away from it. If, in other words, that they want, uh, as he puts it, to um, they desire to be in some sense um, under under the protection of a man. But then, if they engage in sexual relations, then of course they have offspring, and and you know the man can can do his thing and walk away, but the woman can't. And so there's there's just bio, fundamental biological differences that that, that sort of um, leads women to want to engage in not just uh, romantic relationships, but to want to engage in marriage. That, of course, uh, Mises thinks is, is you know, more socially stable uh, than uh, the socialist call for free love. But um, he also makes the point, however, in classical liberal societies where uh, we move past the idea that, that, that uh, wives are owned by their husbands, that, that wives cannot uh, own property, uh, that, that wi wives are somehow trapped in, in, you know, horrible relationships and they can't get out. He said, no, it's, it's the classical liberal view of marriage that, that in some sense elevates the dignity of, of the woman more than socialism ever could or would. But it isn't this so interesting, though? Marx and Engels thought that they were going to liberate the family. And in yeah. fact, it's Western capitalism, which has liberated individuals, including women, far more. And now, I, I, one thing I think Mises says that would not be popular today is he talks about, you know, property fills an important social function. And again, part of the sweep of this book is the social order, not just the economic order. But, right. So if property fills a social function, so does marriage. And I think yes. that would be pretty contentious, certainly with a lot of feminists today. They would say, well, you know, this is just a, a patriarchal thing. But again, he's writing this in, in, the, in 1922 or, or finishing it, publishing it in 1922. And also, again, it's interesting that in his personal life, he actually advanced uh, a lot of female academics in ways that perhaps his male peers weren't doing at the time. Um, Absolutely. I mean, you can look at the the number of uh, you know just the number of female participants in his private seminars, et cetera. Yeah, that that must have been an amazing thing to witness back then, and and it was almost a, a bit of a bold thing for a woman to uh, attend an economic seminar and and have an interest in that at that you know hundred years ago. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But I want to get into the two 
big, meaty portions of the book beyond the socialist calculation debate. And that's where he attacks basically two ideas. One is that socialism is inevitable. And two yes. is that socialism is moral, that it operates on an ethically higher plane, regardless of whether it actually produces the results it says it will produce. So in in his in his section on the alleged inevitability of socialism, he gets into – really, he gets pretty deep into class theory and yes. he gives us a pretty in-depth critique of that. And of course, Hoppe would do that later as well. Yep. Um, again, this is pretty far afield for an economist. I mean in some sense – he just recognized that if you're going to provide, say, a full critique of socialism, you have to get into these areas because so much of so, you know, socialist uh, policy and, and advocacy was based not purely on you know, economic practicability, but um, also on these broader political and social issues such as the class struggle. I mean, the, the whole point of, of Marx is trying to supposedly – scientifically show why socialism is inevitable and he see and you know and, and Marx sees that the class war and the class struggle is the in a sense the, the engine that, that that pushes the dialect of history along and so Mises has to kind of get into uh, the nature of a so-called class struggle and is there even is there even one that that that, that is pushing history along? Well, and he asked the important question, but why do humans cooperate? And that is an important question. And and the answer is division of labor makes them more productive and better off. And, and yes. this is something that Marx and Engels just simply refuse to contemplate. Absolutely. I mean, that's the, the core of his, his response is that uh, – and again, I mean, I, what, what makes Mises such a pleasure to read is that he begins – just with reality, right? Mises is not doesn't like to entertain romantic notions of how we wish things were. He wants to provide analysis that helps us live in the world that we actually live in. And so he he notes that the the true nature of society is cooperation. It's it's community in action. People coming together and by participating in the division of labor help each other out. And so society develops, uh, as Mises explains, as the market division of labor develops. And he makes a really important point that once we understand that the division of labor is the essence of society, then there is no more sort of antithesis between the individual and society, right? That the individuals perceive uh, the participating in the division of labor as beneficial to them. And then as they participate, they form society. They have an interest that this society then would flourish. But here we are a hundred years later, and we're still enthralled with this idea of class struggle, that everything is about one group against the other, an oppressor and oppressed. And, and of course, we have a hard time making the case which we know to be absolutely true, the case that markets are actually cooperative and communitarian, and centralized planning is the opposite. It creates a cabal of ruthless leaders and leaves everyone outside that leadership w worse off. But but again, we still have to fight these age-old ideas that Mises fought. Oh, absolutely, because for you know, it's still it's in people's political interests, you know, to to foment um, you know class distinctions, just like it was in Marx and Engels' interest to foment class distinctions. Um, and, and class, you know, uh, class interests, class consciousness, as, as they would call it. Again, it, you know, it, like we, you started off, we are started a discussion. Say it's hard to imagine, you know, back in the '80s or back in, you know, the fall of, of of the Iron Curtain in the late '80s. It's hard to imagine how uh, you know open people are advocating socialism today. To me, it's it's hard to, you know, after in my entire life. I heard again and again in in my schooling and 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 in society is you know can we all get along? Can we all get along? We're all there. There's a there's a fundamental similarity uh, amongst human beings, and uh, you know let's let's focus on that. And the, it, within man, the last 10, 15 years, it's it's you know it's identity politics and class politics, and it's 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 amazing how rapidly uh, the worm has turned on this.
Well, the other thing he mentions in this analysis of this sort of bureaucratic overclass that's necessitated, by the way, by central planning, um, is the concept of moral hazard. And this sort of pre-shadows what would later become a debate among some Austrians about the Misesian versus Hayekian knowledge problem. Uh, in other words, and it relates to the socialist calculation issue. Is it is it a knowledge problem or is it a property ownership problem? And when he discusses moral hazard, we get sort of an inkling of, of, of the idea that, no, there's in socialism, there's no incentive to avoid losses. There's no skin in the game. And so uh, it's not just calculation. It's also this idea of ownership that compels and impels people to 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 act better than they will under socialism. In other words, pe people respond to incentives. I mean, this isn't rocket science. Oh, ab absolutely. Um, when he gets to you know a later part of the book, especially he he goes through a number of various policies advocated by uh, a variety of socialists. And he notes a number of places uh, where the the policy itself uh, actually promotes the very thing that the policy is supposed to ameliorate. Uh, in the case, for instance, of social insurance, or in the case of um, unemployment insurance, um, the, the idea that the person who has unemployment insurance is able to bring about the condition of being unemployed, or at the very least can extend his period of unemployment if he wants to by not accepting a job. And when we have um, the ability, again, it gets back to when, when, you, when we have the ability to live off of the income, not that we have uh, uh, earned through production, but we live off somebody else's income, then we have, it alters the incentives we have to be productive or not be productive. Well, when he gets into this idea of not just the inevitability, but the moral or ethical arguments for socialism, he takes another little discursion and he goes off into Christianity quite a bit. Uh, let, let's talk about that. You know, his conception of Christian socialism is coming very much from Germany, uh, yes. having grown up in the in the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he goes on a, at length about well. You know, Christ's teachings are really not about the material world. They're about the hereafter. And so that not only are they uh, compatible with socialism, they may even require it. Um, so, so talk a little bit. You, you happen to be a Christian. Talk a little yes. bit about Mises, is, uh, again, an, an agnostic Jew uh, yeah. and his conception of Christianity and how it shaped his arguments in this book. Yeah, I think um... – Frankly, I think that this section, I would say, I don't know, I can't remember how many pages it covers, but it's the worst part of Mises. Uh, of all of, of all, and I've read a lot of Mises, and I think Mises is great. I just think he misses it. He misses it here. Um, his point is that he thinks that primitive Christianity uh, has, in some sense, has no social ethics. That they weren't, they weren't really interested in laying out social principles of how people should relate to one another because they thought that the second coming of Christ is imminent and the kingdom of God is coming very quickly. And so what, you know, what need do we have of uh, creating or, or thinking about uh, principles of, of, uh, you know, of social ethics. And then he does make the point, you know, be, because Christianity doesn't have any clear social principles in the new Testament, as he puts it, um, then it's true that it doesn't explicitly advocate socialism, he would say, but then it also opens a door for socialism because, um, as he puts it, you know, no art of interpretation can find a single passage in the New Testament that could be read as upholding private property. And, he, and then he goes on to say, Jesus' words are full of resentment against the rich. The rich man is condemned because he is rich. The beggar is praised because he is poor. Um, now, I think it's important that the readers know he's, he, he quotes scripture in a couple places, but he also cites a number of uh, what I would call liberal German theologians and interpreters of these passages. Um, and, and by liberal, I don't mean classical liberal. I mean uh, theologically liberal. So I think that he is in some sense uh, relying on their interpretations of these passages – and I just don't think he gets it right. I think that there is a case to be made in, in, in even in sticking to the New Testament for uh, private property. Um, I lay lay it out some in my own book. So um, I just think that it, it's unfortunate because there are a number of Christians. I know 
people who um, will point to this passage in Mises is socialism and say, see, even Mises argues that Christianity is incompatible with capitalism. And, um, you know, that, of course, that conveniently ignores it later. I mean, he he modifies his opinion on this you know, over over time. You know, this is again, this is something that was written in in uh, 1922 when when, quite frankly, if you look at if you think of the uh, Christian leaders in Europe in 1922, a lot of them were, uh, you know, somewhat socialist. And so um, if he takes them at their word, he's responding to them. He's in some sense, he's he's I would say he's not responding to the to the to the text of the scriptures per se. Well, whether you think it caused it or w- was in spite of it, the I mean, the plain truth is that some of the most free market economies came out of the Christian West. Absolutely. It's indisputable. But it, it, this is also a man who's just come out of fighting World War One, which was in, in many ways the end of civilization. Yes. Um, uh, er, yes. It certainly had to feel like that during the worst parts of the war. Um, but it's interesting to note that he softens his take a little bit in the second German edition of this book, which is 10 years later. He's a little softer on the question of whether liberalism is opposed to Christianity or whether they could uneasily sort of coexist. You know, that's that's right. In later works, I think in in a page or two, and even in human action, I think that it, it's he's a little more he seems more open minded. I think that I think actually my own personal opinion, I think him coming to the United States and interacting with, say, Christian industrialists like J. Howard Pugh, I think actually helped him to broaden his views on this on, on this idea. I'm, I don't think by the end of his life, I don't think he would say that um that, that that Christianity cannot exist side by side with capitalism. I don't think he would say that in, at the end of his life, but um like he like he said it in 1922. Well, there's also the case I think atheists and agnostics in general tend to soften and mellow a bit with age. It's very common. Yeah, that's true. That's right. And some I mean some don't stay that way. Um you know, you're right. I mean people people change. So, he finishes the book with this section he calls destructionism. Yes. And a couple years ago, uh, our own Tom DiLorenzo gave a talk here at the Mises Institute on uh, political correctness as Misesian destructionism. It's really an interesting part of the book. It's a really zingy way to end it. I mean, he yes. talks about socialism as, as the spoiler of what thousands of years of civilization have created. You know, Talk a little bit about the end of the book and what he's getting at here. Yeah, I think what he's he's really – making the point here that socialism is utterly destructive, that there's no way around it. Socialism does not build society. It destroys society by destroying what society is, which is the market division of labor, and also it destroys prosperity by uh, capital consumption. And so the beginning and end of socialist policy, he would say, is destruction. Uh, Socialism wants to – it wants to – and it's not just – Something that happens accidentally. Uh, on the one hand, they 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 want to destroy the social order under private property so they can get to the socialist utopia. In some sense, it, it does get zingy and fiery because I think Mises is wanting to point is just wanting to make it clear that look, this is um, socialism is not something you want to play with because it's not uh, innocuous. It's not something that we can sort of try and then you know if it doesn't work. We're, we're no worse off. No, no, socialism destroys. And then he goes through, you know, the, the varieties of, of destructionist policy. He talks about labor legislation. He talks about uh, social security insurance. He talks about trade unionism. He talks about unemployment insurance. He talks about the socialization of in, industry and, and nationalization of industry. And he talks about uh, taxation and confiscatory taxation and how how rapidly – a, a state will move from, you know, taxing uh, to cover, you know, the night watchman state to taxation for confiscatory purposes, and you know, uh, taxing the taxing the the the, the, pr- the productive and hence the wealthy, so that we can redistribute income to the uh, to the unproductive. 
Yeah, you know, you know what's interesting though is just five years later he produces liberalism, and some of the glowing things he says in there about democracy almost see it, seem at odds with some of the cautions he's giving here. Well, um, it could seem that way, but we want to remember that Mises, the, the virtues of democracy, get back to this idea of the the need for the need for peace for the need that this that the market division of labor has for peace in order for it to develop and that um, the, the the chief virtue of democracy is that it allows for a peaceful transition of power so we don't have you know continual um, revolutions and, and violent upheaval in society typical of Mises he doesn't hinge democracy on some type of uh, ethical principle per se but he he places democracy sees democracy as something that is it's beneficial in the sense that it that it promotes peace, and then if we uh, if we have peace, then that allows for uh, more commercial activity, which allows for the extension of the division of labor and the building of society. Um, and so that would ha- it would fit quite you know the the um, democracy is not something that we uh, the democracy is 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 just a, is a is a means to achieve. The end of a uh, of, of a flourishing market division of labor, but, but of course it can be used to for you know for evil purposes, and that's why I think Mises makes the point that you know um, defeating socialism or uh, you know uh, being able to um, enjoy prosperity uh, that comes from. Uh, the market division of labor and society and, and 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 a free market requires a battle of ideas because in democracy you have people voting for rulers and then rulers voting for you know making laws and so we have to win the battle of ideas. But when we're talking about ideas, we also have to have arguments. We have to have intellectualism. We have to have speech. And and one of the things he talks about is what socialism doesn't just destroy the economy. It also destroys free inquiry. It destroys uh, our our ability to speak out. It destroys our ability to uh, engage in democracy meaningfully. If if that if democracy is your thing, absolutely. It really. What should one say? It it puts the. It puts the individual under the thumb uh, of the central planner. Um, he has this really, I think, interesting uh, section um, in the uh, in the middle of the book, uh, where he talks about how um, when the central planner in socialism, we have a central planner that determines who works where. That also um, applies to the uh, cultural activities. And and scientific uh, activities and um, art and culture and uh, other areas, intellectual areas, become more and more routine because those who don't please please the ruler are not allowed to you know paint. They're not allowed to write literature. They're not allowed to compose music. They're not allowed to pursue scientific inquiry uh, that doesn't please the uh, the state. So what you have is a culture that becomes very very uh, sort of ossified, very routine, almost uh, just a dead repetition almost of the of the past. Well, let me leave you with this uh, thought. <clears throat> I, I think what we can get from this book is we have created an artificial distinction between so-called social or cultural issues and economic issues in our politics. I think Mises' socialism shows us that this is all part of a complete whole, and we need to consider them a- as one instead of making this distinction. Oh, I, yes, I think I think that's right. That that um, you know one's one's economic ideas and policies always occur in the midst of a, a broader culture and always have impacts that are broader than just what we may might say just narrow economic effects. And so um, that's why, again, I think it's so important that, 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 that economic analysis is, as Mises has done, rooted in, in reality so that in that sense, economics is not disconnected from the rest of reality. It's part of reality. Well, Dr. Sean Rittenauer at Grove City, we want to thank you for your time. 
And I want to reiterate to our audience, as I did in the introduction, if you go to our website and use the code HAPOD for Human Action Podcast, you can get a discount on your own copy of Socialism by Mises, the copy that we sell. It's an, it's an excellent read. I think you will enjoy it. And of course, you can go to Mises.org and read it for free in PDF form on our website. So, Sean, thanks again. Oh, thank you very much. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.